Hey there, I'm Scott Whitfield and welcome to Victorian Opera's web series, Artist in Isolation. On this episode, we're delighted to be joined by much-loved tenor, Kanan Breen. Kanan, thank you so, so much for joining us. Hello, Scott. <laughs> now, Kanan, it would appear that not only you like lamp, but you love lamp. How observant of you to detect a lamp or two in the background. That's been one how, many, how many do you have on first count and possibly even out of shot? Uh, no, I, no, because I've got a very, very dodgy fuse box here. So if I, I think if I turn one more on, the whole place would go kaput. And it's a huge drama to get the electricity put back on in this building. But I think, what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven or eight. That's, you know, I wouldn't always have eight on, but I wanted it to look like... I wanted some high drama. I, I kind of feel like you're, you're Barbara Eden or Robin Williams. You, you're almost living in one. Robin Williams? Oh, I see what you're saying. A genie. We're doing a couple of little genie references here for oh, those yes. playing at home. Oh, yes. Well, I was actually going for more of a um, uh, um, bewitched vibe, if anything. I was hoping for that sort of... Well, no, actually, you're right. I dream of genie. I'm sort of going for Amanda Bellows... Aesthetic, you know, the major, whatever his name is, Major Bellows's wife, Amanda Healy, who always used to swan around in diaphanous um, caftans and have crazy lamps and cigarette holders and what have you. That's that's the vibe I'm going for here. And what a way to live. What a way to live. Well, I've got nothing else to do except um, spice up my aesthetic at the moment. So that's what I've been doing. I've been recovering old um, op shop um, vintage lampshades and... It's a lot of fun. It's not quite as straightforward as I might have hoped it would be, but uh, I'm learning a lot. And uh, it forced me to purchase a second-hand uh, sewing machine, which I don't really know how to use, but the hand-stitching was doing my head in a bit uh, and took a very long time. So uh, I finally bit the bullet and, and sourced a, a, a... I mean, it's actually a brand-new sewing machine, but it was being sold second-hand by a girly who um, was too scared to open the box. Um, but I, I wasn't that scared. I had a few drinks and I had a friend around from the Opera Australia costume department to show me how to use it. Um, but we may or may not have drunk so much beer in the course of the lesson that I don't actually recall a lot of what she said. So uh, I'm still flying a bit blind, but I haven't sewn my, my um, hand to my elbow yet. So um, it's all systems go. Is there ever a point where, you know, you're designing something or you're creating something new? Is there ever too much? Do you ever sort of feel a moment of restraint? Ah, uh, yes. No, I, I, I. Uh, whether it be lampshades or an on-stage um, indulgence, I have been known to over-egg the pudding or um, over-gild the lily. Um, yes, but it's generally only in retrospect that I realise these things. So it's. Um, I, I do find I have to in in lampshade world. I have to step back from it. Uh, if I've been going uh, very intensely for a couple of hours, you sort of lose sight and perspective on what you've what you've done, and uh, a lot of the process is quite um, intricate and and frustrating. So you, you lose sight of the big picture, and you just sort of focus on a particular stitch or a particular area that that isn't coming together the way you hoped. And then when you actually stand back and and assess it from a, a, a distance, you sort of go, oh Christ. That is a bit gaudy or it's a bit much. Doesn't generally stop me um, because generally... It's once... something to celebrate, Tainan. It's well, something to celebrate. Once you've hot glued it on or spent nine hours stitching it on, one is very reluctant to then rip it off and start again. And the same is true of, of my various onstage um, shenanigans. Uh, it, it's um, Once the horse has bolted, it's very hard to take these things back. So <laughs> this is why we rehearse <laughs> and don't generally improvise on stage so that directors and colleagues and conductors are aware of what's going to take place before they see it in the moment. When we spoke to Antoinette Halloran and James Eggleston, she shared a particularly hilarious story about you in a performance of HMS Pinafore at the Sydney Opera House. Yes. What's your take on that story for anyone who didn't see it? Well, my, my first response is I'm intensely proud of, of uh, everything that I do on stage. <laughs> Not. Um, and we got the story slightly wrong. So I will, I'll fill in the gaps. Set the record straight. HMS Pinafore, Sydney Opera House, Stuart Maunder's gorgeous production, for, I don't know, 12 years ago or something. Um, I, as Ray Fraxtraw, sang the, his opening number and 
to, not to put it too delicately, uh, cracked the ass off the the last high note in the uh, in the song. Uh, Antoinette was not yet on stage, but clearly had heard it over the tannoy. But uh, the entire Opera Australia Gentlemen's Chorus and various other principals were on stage, and and they all basically, as one, turned their backs on me and the audience, and all you could see were twenty five sets of shoulders going like that. Uh, the scene continued, and ironically enough, the first line that was said after my little vocal infarction was uh, another character turned to Rafe Rexter and said, Oh, my poor lad, you've climbed too high. Uh, That's beautiful. Never Absolutely a true beautiful. word was spoken. Anyway, so I then finished the scene and, and walked downstairs, and not one person would make eye contact with me, so it became very obvious to me that the um, the little vocal issue I'd had was, was detectable. Um, and then Antoinette and I went back upstairs to stage to sing our big sort of um, love duet. And Antoinette got approximately three notes into it before she burst out laughing, probably at the memory of what I had done some 10 minutes earlier. So she launched into refrain audacious and burst out laughing. There may or may not be video footage of this, but uh, I'll never confirm or deny the truth of that, but uh, I, I may or may not have seen it, and it may or may not be every bit as bad as um, my memory tells me. Anyway, she and I guffawed our way through that entire duet, and it was highly unprofessional and highly unbecoming of two um, Australian opera singers on stage at the Sydney Opera House, but these things happen, that's live theatre. Um, I would also draw Antoinette's attention to the time in <laughs> Victorian opera Sweeney Todd, when I was doing a highly creditable and, and professional job as the Beadle Bamford in the, the parlour scene with her glorious Mrs Lovett, when uh, uh, for no reason that I could detect, I was doing exactly what I'd always done in every other rehearsal and performance, she just started laughing and couldn't, and this was in a performance, um, basically sort of didn't do very much in the scene except stand there and laugh. Um, which was great. It gave me a time to shine. Well, you know, because she basically stole that show. So it was nice when she would have a moment where someone else could shine for a second. But yes, she she has been known to lose it. And it's not always my fault. Not always. Sometimes, but not always. Oh, one of mother's favourites. If one bell rings in a tower of prey, a ding dong, your true love will stay. A ding dong, one bell today in the tower of bright ding dong. What's that? Can I can I say in in Antoinette's defence, yes. having seen your performance as Beetle Bamford, particularly in that parlour scene, you were riotously funny. Oh, you. Absolutely, I remember seeing that performance several times. They're just crying and crying and crying with laughter. I'll, that that I'll, scene I'll before the interview was one of I the great you were crying at the, at the pathos of the, the um, integrity of my performance. Because that's what I was oh. going for. You must always play for truth. That's what I always do. That's what I always say, and I think that comes across to the audience as well. Words to live by, Canaan. Words. Oh to live yes, by. and to die by. <laughs> You've done so many iconic. Uh, performances for Victorian opera, be it as Beetle Bamford or in Black Rider or Banquet of Secrets. Have there been any particular highlights for yourself in terms of when you've worked for Victorian opera? Working for Victorian opera in and of itself is a highlight. And I think any singer that works for, for your beautiful company would say that. Um, the, the highlight for me is how every department functions so beautifully together and how the company is... is of a size that that its ambitions are realised with such integrity and, and the results are always so wonderful, so eclectic. Um, but there's such a, at the heart of the company and at the heart of every process that I've always ever been through at Victorian Opera is this sense of family and this sense of respect and fair play and kindness and compassion and concern and a, just a real love for the art, the artists, and the the extended family that it takes to, to put on a show, be that a traditional opera or a musical or something like Black Rider, which remains to this day quite uncategorizable in my um, view. A wonderful show, brilliant, but kooky as hell and 
again, I mean, that was another show that was such an easy world to enter into. Uh, the the design, the aesthetic of it, and the, the sound world, and the, the, the mania of it was just so much fun to play in. So the highlight is uh, every show I've done at Victorian Opera has been a wonderful experience. Um, but, uh, every conductor I've ever worked with has been a joy and a collaborator. Every director has, has had a sense of fairness and fun and brings discipline without a heavy handedness. The, every cast has, has instantly become family and you just, uh, it's true of every show you ever do. You do become, whether it's dysfunctional or highly functional, a family. And, and that's really at the heart of the Victorian opera experience for me is every time I, I return, it's, it's a real sense of homecoming and a, a, such a warm welcome and just uh, it, it's a get down to work experience with lightheartedness and uh, real integrity. And it's just, it's such a pleasure. It's a treat. You guys are wonderful. You've just been working on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which you toured around the country. What is that schedule like when you're doing, say, eight shows a week compared to a, a more traditional operatic schedule where you might be doing j just, say, a handful of performances? I, I thought at the outset that I was really going to struggle with that because um, certainly in the last couple of years prior to, to starting the rehearsals for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I, I wasn't... Um, uh, a full-time member of any particular company so uh, I had had more downtime than I had had for a very long time but what emerged very quickly in the rehearsal process and then once the show had opened and we were doing eight or nine shows a week was that my time in the um ensemble at Opera Australia ha was really the best training I could ever possibly have had because even though it's it's true that we may only have done three or four performances of operas a week. When you were a member of the full-time principal ensemble at OA, you would be rehearsing a different show during the day, performing another show at night and coaching a third and fourth show uh, uh, in the gaps between that whilst learning uh, a fifth and sixth show that was coming up as soon as the show you were performing at the moment um, closed. So uh, in terms of hectic schedules and keeping a lot of balls in the air at once and um, using up a lot of energy um, six days a week, um, I was actually very well trained without realising it to cope with the, the um, relentlessness of an eight or nine show week for months and months and months. And you, you actually get into an extraordinary routine um, we're in, I mean, in a, in a strange way, it's a bit like sleepwalking, not on stage, but in terms of the routine that you get into and, and yes. what it takes to stay fit and well. And um, I mean, I was also covering a lot of roles in, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So beyond the eight or nine shows a week we were doing, there were cover calls and, and coachings and all that sort of stuff. So it was pretty full on. Um, but uh, actually eminently survivable. I actually, uh, I didn't miss a show uh, over the entire 15 months, I think it was, that we ran. Um, and I was the only one in the entire cast who didn't miss a single performance, um, which, you know, is neither here nor there, except that uh, I can put that down to the fact that I was very lucky. I got sick a couple of times, but it, thankfully that didn't, I mean, Corona didn't exist at the time, so you were still able to turn up to work if you had a slightly runny nose. Um, and it didn't coincide with times when I had to go on in, in major roles. So um, you just battle through and, and get the job done. Um, it was actually a real treat to, to um, see how a, a, a large music theatre piece is put together and, and how it runs day to day. It's an extraordinary mechanism to keep a show in great shape um, over a long period of time and to stay interested in it and to stay interested in the people that, is, that you're basically face to face with completely six or seven days a week. Um, but uh, it wasn't a bad egg in the company and uh, it was a real, it was such fun, it was beautiful. And then of course it came to a, a very premature end on the 15th of March when we closed before we even opened in uh, Brisbane, which was a, a pretty ignominious end to a, a very happy journey, but uh, we're certainly not unique in that regard. There was a lot of um, uh, <laughs> carnage at that particular point in time, and it continues to 
unfold. Um, but you've got to, I mean, we were, we were lucky because we were coming to the end of our run anyway and we'd had a, a really good time. There were some shows that, that never even opened uh, for their opening season. So um, in, in that context, we were very lucky. It was very sad to have to say goodbye to that family under, that, under those circumstances, but we were far more fortunate than many. So um, gratitude is the attitude. You co-parent a son, Xander, with your dear, dear friend, Jackie Dark. Yeah. I was wondering what sort of joys and challenges COVID-19 has brought to you guys as a family. Well, the thing that we thought was going to be the biggest challenge actually ended up being the biggest joy, um, and that was homeschooling him for the seven or eight weeks that uh, that took place in the last term. He's actually on school holidays now. He went back for a couple of weeks before... Um, the holidays started so he's got another week of those holidays and he is due to go back um, uh, in a week Um, it remains to be seen whether that will actually happen given how notionally everything is notional yes it's all notional and and subject to change at the drop of a hat anyway um, yeah homeschooling ended up being a a a fantastic uh, again it was a routine that we got into that something that we feared was going to feel quite relentless and and um, unpleasant turned out to be I mean we're very lucky in that he's a bright kid and he's um, curious about life and interested about learning and not just interested in learning facts but interested in the process of learning and how one learns best and what have you so he was able to uh, I mean Jackie and I actually both have teaching degrees secondary teaching degrees but um So we knew a little bit about what was required of us, but we were certainly led by what he uh, was interested in. He's really numerate, so um, setting him maths work that that was appropriate to his age group, he's in grade two, but also challenged him was initially uh, uh, tricky, but in the end, I mean, we, we probably pushed him harder and he's probably at a grade five level in maths now but um just keep going saying? just keep going well yes well so, well he's very smart and they'll there will come a day when he um says i don't get what you're doing and we'll stop but so, i mean he's taken to fractions and percentages and and all that sort of stuff like a duck to water and he loves language and uh his penmanship really improved so we were it, it uh, homeschooling was fantastic and uh we we got into such a routine of doing the class in the morning and then he taught himself to ride a bike um, while he was at home. So we would go down to the, the, there's a huge park near Jackie's place that was largely abandoned. Uh, So he was able to really get his confidence up on his bike. I mean, and all of this would never have happened had it not been for COVID. So there are certainly silver linings and uh, Jackie and I were very unfortunate and fortunate in that all of our work dried up overnight. So we really and truly had nowhere else to be and, and nothing else to do. So once once we surrendered to that reality, um, the new reality of uh, of all of this time together and um, all of the achievements that were possible with that time were, were just joyous. Kanan, as our final question, I was wondering, what's the first thing that you'd like to do after this time passes? I want to... F- be in a theatre again, and I uh, uh, I don't necessarily want to be on stage in a theatre or need to be on stage, but I want to have that collective human experience that ha- has been so much a part of so many of our lives and our livelihoods and our day-to-day purpose. Uh, it's a very strange, it's like losing a limb when, when that all dries up and goes away as instantaneously as it um, did. And it's, it's like a drug as well. Like, I think we've all gone through a real cold turkey um, since the performing arts were shut down. Um, so I'm ready for my next hit of, of that face-to-face um, collective theatrical experience in, a, in a, you know, the lights going down and the orchestra warming up and the curtain going up and the, the, the ritual of, of theatre going and, or... Um, music making or theatre making, whatever it is, I really miss it. And I've been really inspired by um, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurialism of um, so many of my 
mates and people that I admire in the performing arts who have taken to um, sort of producing online content with such um, daring and inventiveness and what have you. But it's st at the end of the day, that is still a two dimensional experience. Um, and I'm really hungry to get back into 3D and be in an, an acoustic that is designed for theatre and a space that it is designed to, to hold and contain that magic. Um, and that concentration that just is, it's just not as possible when viewed through a computer screen or a, um, a television screen. Theatre and, and music of the calibre that I enjoy and that, that I like making uh, is best served up in a, in a theatrical space that's appropriate to it. So, uh, yeah, may it be sooner rather than later that we can all buy our tickets and, and be in a, a theatre together. And uh, I mean, that's the other thing about watching stuff online. You, the, like, you don't get other, you're not swept up in, in an audience response. You're having your own wonderful response. But at the end of the day, it's, a, it's still quite a solo experience. Um, and I really, I don't think I realised how much that, that audience, uh, both interaction and presence and energy it informs the experience and you, it's really been an eye opener to to experience that absence and um, register how magic that is. It really is. It's a type of magic. And, and if ever there was a time in the world that that magic was required, it's now. So it's a very sad irony that, that, that we will be the last uh, to return to to normal whatever the new normal is because it's you know the arts and and what they bring to the human soul have never been more desperately needed so it's a real sadness that uh, it's such a, a difficult uh thing to get back to but it will happen it will happen kanan it has been such a, a joy to chat to you thank you so much for for joining us and please stay safe thanks scott you too lots of love to you all the beautiful beautiful people I miss you all. For more chats with artists in isolation, you can follow Victorian Opera across social media or visit victorianopera.com.au. I'm Scott Winfield. Thanks for watching.